Bismillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi amma ba'du. Welcome to another episode of Islam 101. I'm your host, Abu Usama al Dhahabi, and we have here from amongst our students, Sardar, as well as Nick, we have Ushar, as well as Usama. Today's topic is, again, an issue concerning the adab or the etiquettes that Al Islam has placed a lot of emphasis on. And today's etiquette is the etiquette of al haya, al haya, which means bashfulness or being shy. Many people believe and they understand that bashfulness and shyness is a characteristic that is peculiar to the woman, especially the young woman. And this is partly true, but not totally true, at least not in the religion of Al-Islam. Bashfulness is a very important characteristic trait that every Muslim man and every Muslim woman has to cultivate. The Prophet told us, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is showing its importance. إِنَّ لِكُلِّ دِينَ خُلُقًا وَإِنَّ خُلُقَ الْإِسْلَامِ الْحَيَاءِ Every single religion has a character trait that is known for. And the character trait of Al-Islam is bashfulness or shyness. That doesn't mean that bashfulness and shyness is something that is only for Muslims or in our religion. No. We believe that all of the prophets and all of the messengers, they encouraged their people and they commanded their people to have bashfulness and shyness because it only brings good. As the prophet said, لا يأتي الحياة إلا بخير. Bashfulness does nothing but bring benefit and good. Why do I say that the other prophets and the other messengers, they commanded their people and they taught their people about the importance of shyness? It is due to the presence of an authentic hadith that shows the richness of the Arabic language and it also shows the richness of the ability that Rasulullah had to articulate where his words can have multiple meanings, all of which are good and beneficial. He says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Inna mimma adurak al-nas min kalam al-nubuwat al-ula idha lam tastahi fasna' ma shit. From what the past prophets taught all of their people, all of the prophets said to their people when they came, if you feel no shyness, if you're not bashful, then go ahead and do what you want. Go ahead and do what you want if you're not bashful about it. This hadith can be understood in two ways. The first way it can be understood is if a person doesn't have any shyness, if he doesn't have any shyness, he's not bashful. Bashfulness and shyness has been taken out of his heart. Then that person is going to do whatever he wants to do because he has no shyness to prevent him from doing what he wants to do. It's like the individual who steals from his mother or his father. It's like the individual who hits his mother or his father. If he had bashfulness, if he had haya, he would never allow himself to strike the woman who gave birth to him, no matter how upset and angry he became at her. Because of his lack of haya, no bashfulness, he would go ahead and hit her. The individual who, for an example, finds himself in a place, he's the guest of a man in his home, and he finds that there's a trust or an amana. No one's looking. He's the guest of another man. That man is feeding him and taking care of him. That individual goes and he steals from the home of his host. How is he allowed to steal? Because he has no hayat. The man who has hayat, the woman who has hayat, who is shy and bashful, that bashfulness will prevent them. That bashfulness will say to them, don't do that. That's an a'i. That's a terrible thing to do. So the person won't do it. So that's the first way of understanding this hadith. If you feel no shyness, then do what you want to do. You're going to do whatever you want to do because you don't have any hayat. The woman who goes, she was raised up in a home. She's the bintu nas. She's not a bintu shara. She's a woman who was raised by her parents to be good and decent. She's not a woman from the street raised in the gutter. That individual, she's not going to make zina. She's not going to commit fornication because she has hayat. She will not allow herself to go with another man and have this type of relationship. Why? Because she represents her father. She represents her uncle. She represents her brother. She represents her mother. Her hayat doesn't allow her to go and just hang out with men. That's the first meaning of the hadith. The second meaning of the hadith, and this is for the minority of the people. If you don't have any shyness, then do what you want to do. The meaning of it is, 
If you are a person who your fitra is still okay, your fitra is salima, is still okay, is still correct, it hasn't been contaminated, it hasn't been destroyed. If you want to do something and you don't know, can I do it? Should I not do it? And you're you're mutaraddit, you don't know. You're hesitant, you're not sure. Well, all you have to do is check your heart. If you're not shy about doing it, then that means it's okay. And if you're shy about doing it, then that means that it's not okay. But that's for the minority of people. If you don't feel shy about it, then go ahead and do it. But most people, their fitra has been contaminated. The natural disposition to know right from wrong that has been contaminated with most of the people. So al haya bashfulness, shyness is a major character trait that every Muslim man and every Muslim woman should try to cultivate in their lives. When we look at Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, one of his companions, may Allah be pleased with him, he described Rasulullah and he said, كَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ أَشَدُّ حَيَاءٍ مِّنَ الْعُذْرَاءِ فِي خِدْرِهَا The Prophet was more shy than the virgin girl who was in the inner recesses of her home. The virgin girl in the inner recesses of her home. Rasulullah was very shy. But his shyness did not prevent him from saying the truth. So don't come to understand that shyness means when you have to stand up and defend yourself that you should be afraid and say, this is haya, this is modesty, this is shyness. La. You have to defend your religion. You have to call to your religion. You have to defend your rights. You have to defend your property. You have to defend your family members. And this is considered to be what is acceptable in the religion of Islam. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he himself, he had haya. He was shy. But he wasn't shy when it came to explaining the religion. There are two people who do not learn, and they'll never learn in the religion of Islam or outside of the religion of Islam. Even in the secular world, in the university, the person who's studying in college or in university. The two people who will never learn is the one who is very shy or the one who is very arrogant. The one who is arrogant he doesn't learn because he thinks he knows everything. You can't tell him anything. And the one who is shy, he'll never learn because he's afraid. He's bashful. He's shy to ask someone what the answer is to that particular issue. And that's why our mother Aisha, radiallahu anha, she used to praise the women from the Ansar. She used to say, Rahimallahu nisa al-Ansar, ma mana'ahunna al-haya, minan yatafaqahna fi deen May Allah have mercy upon the Ansar women. Those women who lived in Al Medina. May Allah have mercy upon them. Their shyness did not prevent them from learning the religion. So there are certain issues, certain characteristics, personal issues that a person may be embarrassed about. He needs to know what should I do about this issue that may be connected to the private parts, it may be connected to sex, things like this. You can't be shy in your religion. You have to go about asking people you can trust in a way. That is not going to make people uncomfortable and not make yourself uncomfortable. How is a person going to know when he has to make the ghusl? How is the person going to know the woman who comes off of her mints, akramakum Allah? How is she going to know? How does she prepare herself to make the salat if she doesn't go and say, Ya Rasulullah, what should the woman do after she finishes, finishes her monthly cycle? If she was shy and she refused to ask that question, she would be left without worshiping Allah correctly. So shyness Brothers and sisters in Al-Islam, our respected viewers, it is a concept that we all have to build and we all have to cultivate, we all have to nurture it within our repertoire of Islamic characteristics. As it relates to the woman, Abu Sa'id al-Khudri said that the Prophet was more shy, he was more bashful than the virgin girl in the inner recesses of our home. Why did he mention the virgin girl? Because normally the virgin girl or women in general they tend to have more hayat. They are more bashful than men. So we want to make a particular call here and we want to say to all women of the world, from all of our viewers, you, more than anyone, you have to be shy. You have to be shy. Do not allow these people to cause you to see yourself as a sex object. That's all you are. So therefore, you're flirtatious with men. Therefore, what you wear is revealing. Therefore, all you see yourself is as a sex object that's out trying to become something that draws the attention and attracts the attention of men. In our religion, 
the Messenger of Allah, he told us, Sallallahu Alaihi wa ala alihi wa sallam, that the woman who was married before, her husband died or she has been divorced. She is called the Thayyib. He said, A Thayyibu, a haqqu bi nafsiha min waliyyiha. The one who has been married before, the woman, she was divorced or her husband died. She's a widow. She has more rights over herself than her father or her wali. When she wants to marry the next man, if her father says don't marry him because she was married before, she has more rights to say, no, I'm going to marry him. And then he went on to say, and this is the shahid, this is the point of the hadith, وَالْبِكْرُ تُسْتَأْذِنْ وَسُكُوتُهَا إِذْنُهَا and the girl who's a virgin, she has to be asked for her permission. You have to ask her, do you want to marry so-and-so and do you want to marry so-and-so? And if she remains silent, her silence is her consent. Why does she remain silent? Because when a family comes and she says, the family says, so-and-so wants to marry you or we want to marry you to so-and-so. Because she's so embarrassed to answer the question concerning marriage. And marriage concerns some issues that are embarrassing to her. She doesn't want to talk about those issues in front of her father, to her mother even. So she remains silent. Her silence is considered to be her consent. So that hadith clearly shows us how the girl in particular, the woman in particular, is an individual who she has al-hayat more than anyone. So we want to remind all of the women here, all of the women who are viewing this particular show, that you have to add on to the existing bashfulness that you have and to have an abundant amount of hayat in your life. We're going to stop here for just this one minute in order to take from our students here, the panel members. If you guys have any questions again or any comments concerning the hayat, please feel free to say what you have to say. Yes, sir. Concerning the issue of enjoining good and forbidding evil. Uh, sometimes I, I, I saw people, I see people uh, committing mistakes, but I feel shy and bashful to uh, ask them to correct their behavior. Do you think this is Islamic or, or I have to uh, pick this shyness and go and tell them the right or what? You have to break this particular shyness because they have a right over you that you tell them and there's a responsibility on you that you tell them. The Prophet told us, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, لا تمنع أن أهدكم هيبة الناس أن يقول الحق إذا شهده أو سمعه أو عرفه. Do not allow the person to make you afraid to say the truth when you know the truth or you've witnessed the truth. You have to tell them the truth. You have to tell them without being afraid. And we'll come back inshallah after this quick break and we'll continue with the issue of al-hayat in the religion of al-Islam and the role it plays. Islam 101 Please, brothers and sisters, in particular brothers, husbands, divorce is the last resort. Even when I was given the topic, the art of divorce, I was thinking, why are we talking about a divorce? As they say in management, do you take serious decisions when you are angry? Mm. No one is taking a very serious decision yeah. in his life, yeah. maybe in his business, while you are angry. A divorce happens every six minutes. We are not talking about enjoying the divorce, but we are talking about certain steps uh, to be followed in order to avoid divorce or minimize the possibility of divorce or minimize the consequences of divorce. Any divorce taking place have many ill effects. So we would like to minimize those ill effects. Islam 101 Welcome back to an episode of Islam 101. And we're discussing al-haya or bashfulness, shyness in the religion. Before the break, our brother Usama, he may mention about the issue of being shy to say the truth when a person sees something that's being done that's incorrect. And we explained how the Prophet of Al-Islam told us that it is not permissible for us to allow the fear of someone, the haybah. A person has a position 
And because of his position or his personality, we become afraid for him. It can be the father. It can be the uncle. It could be the mudir or the person who is in charge at the job, your boss, the one who's in charge. It can even be the husband of a woman. The position of the husband makes her afraid. So as a result of that, we see that individual doing something that's not permissible. And the fear of that person, his personality or his position causes us not to say anything about it. The messenger of Allah said, no, don't allow that haba. Don't allow the fear of anyone to prevent you from saying the truth. If you know the truth or you witness the truth or you heard the truth, go ahead and try to do what is an obligation upon you, which is to give good advice in a way that is nice. You don't create for yourself a problem bigger than what you can handle, but you have an obligation to say to that individual what is correct. I know as a revert to the religion of Islam, for an example, just to show you the seriousness of this issue. A person sees the new Muslim in the masjid. He may be making wudu. He doesn't know how to make wudu. He doesn't know how to pray. He may do something that he thinks is the correct thing because he's been taught that way. That's what his knowledge has caused him to understand. The other person knows that this thing that he's doing is incorrect. But that person takes it for granted that he should know. Or that person takes it for granted or he's afraid of him. He's going to leave that individual just like that. Because I'm a shy person, I'm an introverted person, I don't want to talk and I'm not extroverted. Well, as long as that person is doing that evil and he's doing that crime and he's making that mistake and you know that it's wrong, now you are sinning. That person may not even be sinning because he doesn't know, but you know and you remain silent. So the question that presents itself is, who do you fear the most? Do you fear the anger of that individual or do you fear Allah? And many times, there's not a lot to be afraid of. There's not a lot to be afraid of. If you approach the issue in a nice way, in an intelligent way, a responsible way, a way of wisdom, you'll get usually the best results out of that particular thing. So al-haya in this particular issue, it is not correct. Al-haya, bashfulness and being shy is not acceptable when it comes to learning the religion. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he told us about three individuals. He was given a talk in his masjid. Three men came. One man, he came all the way up and he found the place inside of the masjid and he sat close to Rasulullah to listen to what was being said. Another man, the second one came and he was shy. He didn't want to come so that the people could see him. So he sat all the way in the back. And then the third man, he was arrogant. He said, I don't want to listen to that. And he kept going. So while Rasulullah was talking, he said to the people, shall I not tell you about the three men? The three people, he didn't say who they were. He said, as for one man, he came into the masjid and he came all the way up. He came to Allah and Allah came to him, meaning Allah will connect his affairs. Allah will forgive him. Allah will give him the success in the things that he wants to do. The second person, he was shy. So Allah was shy from him. Allah is shy in a way that befits his majesty. That man was shy and he sat in the back. So Allah was shy from him. The third person was arrogant and he turned away. So Allah turns away from him. Allah won't answer his dua, his supplication. Allah won't bring his affairs together. So that's one of the places that is not permissible to be shy. Concerning this characteristic of al-hayat. From the virtues of al-hayat and the importance of al-hayat is that as this hadith that we just mentioned suggested, Allah is also shy. But he's shy in a way that befits his majesty. Inna Allah kareem. Inna Allah kareem. Hayi. Yastahyi an yarfa' al-raju ilayhi yadayhi fa yurudduhuma sifra khaibatayn. Allah is generous and Allah is shy. He is shy for a person when he makes supplication to raise his hands and to ask Allah for things that he wants. Allah is shy not to give him anything. So that goes to show us that the person, when he makes dua, when he makes supplication, it is highly recommended to raise your hands. If you raise your hand and you make dua, supplication with sincerity and according to the sunnah and you're eating correctly, and your money is halal and everything, you're taking care of the conditions of a dua. Allah does not like to not give you what you're asking for. But 
Allah is shy in a way that befits his majesty. He's not shy the way the woman is shy. He's not shy the way the human being is shy. He is shy in a way that befits his majesty. So we're going to open up the floor again, the door again, the opportunity again for our students. If they have any questions, you can put them forth. Usama. Yes, sir. You said in the first segment that uh, the mother of the believers, Aisha radiallahu anha, uh, praised the women of Ansar. Uh, she said, uh, may Allah have mercy upon the women of Ansar. Uh, their bashfulness did not prevent them from seeking knowledge uh, but sometimes uh, as a new Muslim when uh, one goes and asks a scholar about uh, a very easy piece of information but for him it's no uh, like how to perform pollution or how to pray uh, morning prayer subh or uh, the the guy or the, the scholar start to uh, starts to reproach him and repack him. Do you think the problem is this guy who is asking or uh, what? Uh, concerning these issues, the person who's in a position where he's being asked a question, if someone asks him a question about the religion, especially if it's a revert person or an ignorant person, the scholar should not rebuke him. The scholar should not be rough and tough and mean with him. Shouldn't make him to be feeling like he's stupid or he's ignorant. She has mercy upon him because there's no dumb question in Al-Islam. There's no simple or stupid question in Al-Islam. Allah told us, if you don't know, ask those who know. And that's how the Prophet was, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Rasulullah would be on the mimbar and he would give the Friday sermon in the masjid on Friday, a Bedouin man will come into the masjid and he will interrupt the speech of Rasulullah. And he will say, Ya Rasulullah, Rajulun Jahil, Ataytuli As'aluka and Amri Dini. O Messenger of Allah, I'm an ignorant man. I came to ask you about the religion. He will interrupt the khutbah, the sermon. All of the people are sitting there listening to the sermon. They took time out from their jobs to come. And here this man comes and he cuts off the sermon. What did Rasulullah say? Did he say, get out of here, you jahil, you're ignorant, you're stupid. Why can you interrupt? Don't you understand? Don't you have any sense? No. What he did was he told the people, bring me a chair. They brought him a chair. He came off of his pulpit and he sat and he started teaching the man the religion, the issues, the questions that the man had. After finishing with the man, he told the man, get in the line, get in the soft, get in the middle, get with the people. And then he got back on the mimbar. And he started talking and he finished the sermon. That's how the prophet was. People would come to him and they would ask questions that were well known. The young man was unmarried. He came and he said, Ya Rasulullah, it the leave and Ezmiya. Oh Rasulullah, give me permission to make zina. I want to fornicate. The man has sincerity. He didn't want to go out and fornicate, and it's not permissible. He said, Make a special rule for me. Make a ruhsa for me, a concession. I'm asking you, please, just let me because I can't handle my desires. I want to fornicate. The people looked at the boy as if to say, how can you come and ask such a question? What do you think was the response of Rasulullah? Did he slap the man? Did he say, take this man and stone him, put him in prison, put him in jail? He said to the boy, do you like for someone to fornicate with your mother? The boy said, of course not. Do you like someone to fornicate with your sister? The boy said, of course not. Do you like them to fornicate with your khala and your amma, your maternal aunt and your paternal aunt? He said, may Allah protect us from that. He said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, so also the other people don't like that. And then Rasulullah grabbed the boy and made dua for the boy and he went away. So this is the hikmah of Rasulullah, the wisdom, putting everything in its proper place. Everything, knowing how to deal with people and who to deal with why. A person may not be a scholar, he may be a professor in the university. And in the university, we're paying our money to get educated. We're going after the degree to pay our own money. So a person raises his hand and he asks the professor, what about this equation or what about that issue? And the professor says, you know you're stupid. You know you don't understand anything. You know that you're wasting your time here. 
This is an indication, an example of a person who doesn't have any rahmah, nor does he have any hikmah. He doesn't have any mercy, nor does he have any wisdom, nor is he on the way of Rasulullah. And to make it even worse, we're paying our money for him to say something like that to us. Nah, this is not acceptable by any stretch of the imagination. The sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is the best example. As we mentioned in one of our episodes when Allah described him, he said about him that you have in Rasulullah a perfect example, the perfect example. And we have not sent you, O Muhammad, except as a rahmah, a mercy to all of the worlds. And this is how he was. The people found him easy to approach and they can come and ask him about anything concerning the religion because it's his job and his responsibility. So the father who was muwaffaq, the mother who is a good mother and they know what they're doing, they're the ones who... They never make the child feel as if the child is making a mistake for asking a particular question. The professor, the teacher, the scholar, the one who is given the khutbah, other than that, the mudarris, the sheikh, the one who knows what he's doing and he's mufid and he's benefiting the other people, he's the one who knows how to deal with the people. Now, don't get me wrong. There are some people who they, ask, they, they put forth questions that are problematic, like the man who said to al Imam Malik. The man came into Prophet Muhammad's masjid. He had a big turban. He had a very white foban. He had a big long beard. And Imam Malik being an old man, he used to sit and his foot, his feet would be out like that. When the man came in, Imam Malik thought the man was a scholar. So out of respect, he brought his legs in. Out of respect. And he continued to talk. It was time for the questions and the answers. The man raised his hand. He wants to ask a question. And Imam Malik said, yes, go ahead and ask the question. The man said, okay, Imam Malik, I have a question. In the month of Ramadan, if the sun rises from the west and it sets in the east, how do we begin our fast? Everyone knows that the sun is going to rise in the east and it's going to set in the west. When the sun is coming up, it's Fajr time, we have, we stop eating. The man said, if it comes in the west and goes in the east, what do we do? Ali Imam Malik, when he heard that, he put his legs back out. Because he realized this is a question of an ignorant person who's trying to make trouble. But in general, we're going to do what? We're going to take every single issue and every question in a way that is appropriate. So we're going to bring this to a close now. And we look forward to seeing you in the next and upcoming episode of Islam 101. Thank you for your participation. <laughs>